11, two, go home. Down, down into darkness, the current tugged me, and I went with it, pulling myself through the water in a crude and feeble attempt at swimming. I swam forward as well as down, my hand touched something, and as my shoulder banged painfully against it, I knew I was at the wall, but still unbroken, with no sign of an opening, and the current still dragging down. Possibilities and fears crowded in on me, the water might flow out through gratings which I would be unable to remove, or there might be more nets and I would tangle myself in them. The whole enterprise seemed hopeless. There was a pressure of air in my lungs, the beginning of a roaring in my head. I breathed out a little and drew a small breath of air in. Five minutes, Fritz had said. How long had I been under already? I realised that I had no idea. It might be ten seconds, or ten times that. Panic, the fear of drowning, clutched me and I wanted to turn and swim back up against the pull of water, up to the surface where I had left Fritz. I swam on and down, trying to blank my mind to everything but the need to hold on. If I abandoned things now, we were lost anyway, and we must not lose. One of us had to get through. Far above me, there was a dim green radiance, but darkness was all round and below me, and I was diving deeper into it. I took another shallow breath to ease my aching lungs. I wondered if I were already past the point of no return. Then, there was turbulence, the current breaking up and changing direction. I reached forward, but there was still an impassable solidity. Down, down, an edge, an opening. The tide carried me into it, and I realised that now, finally, I was committed. The current was stronger, more closely channelled. I had to go on because there was no hope of getting back. So I swam and I was carried along in utter blackness. I took shallow breaths when I felt I must. Time as it passed became more and more immeasurable. There was a sense of having been hours down there, not minutes. Occasionally I bumped my head against the hard surface above me. If I swam down a few feet, I could touch the bottom of the conduit. Once my outstretched hand brushed against a side wall, but I was too concerned with getting through to want to establish how wide it might be. The shallow breaths were no longer enough. I had to breathe more deeply, and this did not help either. I was breathing in my own exhaled breath. I felt a hammering inside my head. A blackness was growing there to match the blackness of the water. It was all hopeless. A trap with no way out. I was finished. And so was Fritz. And those we had left behind in the White Mountains. All mankind. I might as well give up. Stop struggling. And yet... It was the faintest of glimmers at first, something that only inextinguishable optimism could read as light. But I flailed on with my weary arms, and it grew. Brightness filtering through, white light, not green. It must be the end of the tunnel. The pain in my chest was savage, but I found I could almost ignore it. Nearer, brighter, but still out of reach. Another stroke, I told myself, and another, and another. The brightness was right over me, and I kicked and fought my way up to it. Brighter and brighter, and a bursting through to the eye-piercing brilliance of the earthly sky. The sky, but not the air for which my tortured lungs were crying out. The sealed mask helped me. I tried to release the buckle of the belt, but my fingers were too feeble. I was being carried down river, the mask buoying me up. Buoying and also suffocating. I tried again and failed again. What a terrible irony, I thought, that I should have come so far only to choke to death in freedom. I clawed at the mask ineffectually. I was filled with a sense of failure and shame, and then the blackness, for so long barely held at bay, swooped down and swallowed me. 
my name was being spoken, but from a long way off. There was something wrong about that, I thought drowsily. It was my name, but pronounced in the English fashion, not with the initial V, to which I had grown accustomed since we had been speaking German. Was I dead, I wondered? In heaven, perhaps? Are you all right, Will? Did they speak English in heaven? But it was English with an accent, a voice I remembered. Beanpole! Was Beanpole in heaven too? Are you all right, Will? I opened my eyes and saw him kneeling above me on the river's muddy bank. He said with relief, You are all right. Yes, yes, I gathered my scattered senses, a bright autumn morning, the river flowing beside us and the sun from which my eyes still automatically turned away, and farther off, the great rampart of gold topped by the vast green crystal bubble. I really was outside the city. I stared at him. But how did you get here? The explanation was simple. When Fritz and I had gone, taken by the tripods, he had intended to go back to the White Mountains and tell Julius what had happened. But he had not been eager for it and had stayed in the town a few days listening for anything that was said that might be useful. One thing he learned was the approximate site of the city, and he thought he might as well go and take a look at it. It lay, he was told, across a tributary of the great river down which we had come together. He took the hermit's boat and paddled south and east. Having found it, he decided to survey it. He dared not risk approaching the wall by day, but on nights, when there was moonlight, some, but not too much, he made his investigations. The result was not encouraging. There was no break in the wall and no hope of scaling it. One night he dug down several feet, but the wall continued still farther, and he had to fill in the hole and leave as dawn broke. None of the capped approached the city, so he was safe from their attentions. There were farms within reach and he lived on what food he could pick up or steal. Once he had been right round the city, there seemed little point in staying on, but it was then that the thought occurred to him too, that if anyone were going to escape, the river provided what was probably the only feasible route. Its waters plainly were waste from the city. Nothing grew on the banks for a mile downstream. There were no fish, though there were plenty in the part of the river above the city. And he found strange items of debris from time to time. He showed me some various empty containers, including a couple of empty gas bubbles, which ought to have gone into one of the waste cupboards, but had found their way into the river instead. One afternoon he saw something quite large floating in midstream. It was too far for him to see clearly, particularly since his eyes without his lenses were weak, but he took the boat out and salvaged it. It was of metal, hollow so that it floated, measuring some six feet by two and a foot thick. If that could come out of the city, he argued, a man could. In fact, it was hard to see any other way in which an escape was possible. Because of that, he resolved to take up a position where he could watch the outflow, watch and wait. And so he had stayed here, while the days and the weeks went by, as time passed, his hopes that one of us might get away dwindled. He had no notion of what things were like inside the city, we might have been discovered on the first day as falsely capped and killed. He stayed on, more, 
he said, would mean abandoning the last shred of hope and because hope had anything to feed on. Now with the autumn, he realized that he could not delay much longer if he were to get back to the White Mountains before the heavy snows. He had decided to give it another week and on the morning of the fifth day had seen something else floating down river. He had taken the boat out again, found me and with a knife had ripped open the soft part of the mask to let me breathe. He said, and Fritz? I told him briefly. He was silent and then said, What do you think the chances are? I said, Not good, I'm afraid. Even if he finds his way back to the river, he's much weaker than I am. He said he would try in three days? Yes, three days. We'll keep a close watch, and your eyes are better than mine. We gave him three days, and three times three days, and three days beyond that, each time finding a less convincing argument for our vigil. Nothing came out of the city that we could see, but ordinary debris. On the twelfth day there was a snowstorm, and we huddled shivering cold and hungry under the upturned boat. The next morning, without discussion, we set out under a watery sun, peering through grey clouds towards the great river and the south. Once I looked back, the snow was melting, but the land still stretched bare and white on either side of the river. The river was a grey arrow in the alabaster desert, pointing to the circle of gold and the dome of green crystal. I lifted my arm. It was still a positive joy to be free of the leaden weight that had crushed me for so long. Then I thought of Fritz, and the joy turned to sadness, and a deep and bitter hatred against the masters. We were going home, but only to arm ourselves and others. We would come back. <laughs>